thank you very much for being here. It's really an honor. And um, as you can see, we appreciate your work and your courage very much. You don't really need an introduction, but I'll just say that Ayan Hirsi Ali is a research fellow at the Hoover Institute in, at uh, Stanford University, and she's the founder of the AHA uh, Foundation. Uh, you served in the Dutch Parliament from 2003 to 2006. You focused there on furthering integration of non-Western immigrants to, into Dutch society and defending the rights of Muslim women. You've written prolifically on, on many issues, fam and famously you, your book in 2007 was with Infidel, Nomad from Islam to America, A Personal Journey Through the Clash of Civilizations that you published in 2010, and Why Islam Needs Reformation Now, which you published in 2015, and in 2017 you published The Challenge of Dawah, and you're now working, I know, on another book. So we're really honored that you're here with us at the Summer Institute on Critical Anti-Semitism Studies. So my first question that I would like to pose to you in our conversation is, I think you're really appreciated, I really appreciate your work from afar for many years, and it amazes me with a sense of humility and yet a, a deep courage that you stand up to forces of, of repression and reactionary forces with a dignity. We are a bunch of students and scholars trying to put anti-Semitism on the academic map, on the policy map. Many students deal with issues of racism, sexism, who are here struggling, trying to find commonality. What is your message to us, to faculty and scholars at this moment in history? Mm -hmm. How do we find the courage to stand up, like you? Um, professor, may I call you Charles? Please, yes. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I will first, before I answer your question, I just want to say um, thank you very much for having me here at Oxford. And um, I'm really humbled to be uh, at St. John's um, and to be a part of what ISDAP is trying to do. Um, I also want to thank my mother in law, lives in Oxford and uh, you know, has been here for many years, but is old enough to know. And that brings me to the question you just asked. In 2019, when we talk about courage and bravery, and it's very different, you know. I, I look at my mother-in-law and I think, God, um, her father served in the First World War, in the Second World War, and my um, father-in-law served in the Second World War, and my husband, who's British, is a historian of these world wars. And when I read his books and I digest what these people did, I would say uh, phrases and words like courage and bravery, they belong there. That's not what we are, it's not what we are facing now. Um, I'm a black woman living in America and coming to the United Kingdom and I'm celebrated. I'm not a victim of anything. I chose to come here. I think what I know what I left. I know where I have come to. And I, honestly, I love it. I love being here. <laughs> so it, it, it's, not, it's not courage, it's not bravery. I don't need any compliments for that. I feel very, uncom very uncomfortable with uh, being told over and over again, you're brave, you're brave, you're brave. I'm not brave. But knowing what I know, having come from where I have come from, I think I have an obligation, a duty, to just use plain English, to say, um, selecting part of the population, identifying as the, them as the enemy, demonizing them, and then seeking to destroy them is a human trait that is awful and it's wrong and it's played out everywhere. And doing that to Jewish people, 
Jewish human beings, anti-Semitism. We're here tonight to talk about anti-Semitism. It's the oldest prejudice, if you want to think about it. It's an evil prejudice. It's a monster. And the more I find out about it, the more I think, if we're not able to slay that monster in 2019, how can we face up to all the other prejudices? We thought we did. After the Holocaust, we thought it was over. We, we said, never again, never again, never again. And now here we are. I work on trying to understand Islamist ideology. And Islamist ideology, like all other ideologies and like all other philosophies, it has a vision of the future for society, all society. There's a utopia in place. And part of that utopia is to make the world free of Jews, free of the state of Israel. And if we don't talk about that, if I don't, I, I, feel, I don't think it's courage or bravery or anything like that, but I do feel that it is an obligation to say, isn't this what the other utopias promised? Isn't this what they told us? If we only eliminated the Jews among us, everything would be right? So I'll say, last week we were at a conference, uh, some colleagues and I from ISGAP yeah. were part of a conference here in Oxford University. And we were an amazing group of scholars. Um, one on our panel was a former member of the Knesset, Avram Nagusa, originally from, from Ethiopia. Yeah scholar Yossi Shane from, from Israel, wonderful colleagues and scholars from the United States. Uh, three of us were Jewish, five people were of African origin, African American, oh, yeah. and Jewish, and African. And at this conference, we were ambushed. We were the ISGAP, Zionist, racists, yeah. uh, colonial settlers. Um, I. I was with my colleague Ansel Brown listening in disbelief as people publicly at a university event were actually referring to my colleagues of African or origin as the, I hate to say it, but as the ISGAP Negroes. Mm. And the Zionists were paying to take over this yeah. department. In the yeah. land. And we were, we were stunned. We were shocked. Even though we know these things intellectually, yeah. when it happens to you, I think we were all really shocked and some of us reacted in various ways right so what what do you when when anti-semitism is now yeah i think it's gaining momentum in the academy yeah the universities are becoming purveyors of this hatred yeah a generation is being schooled and educated by more and more scholars who have this world view how do you deal with it how, what is the strategy to, to deal with this at, a, at an intellectual level, to deal with this new hatred that seems to be increasing mm -hmm. exponentially? Um, I would say, what a fantastic question, <laughs> uh, to which obviously I do not have an answer. Again, I, I, I will modestly say, when I point out, look uh, what so-and-so has said, a fellow professor, a fellow colleague, that to me comes across as blatant anti-Semitism. People will say, well, they're coming out of the woodwork. I, I, I guess an education on how European anti-Semitism has never gone away. It has gone underground, but it has never gone away. I get an education on that all the time. People point that out to me. But where do they get the license? And as long as you use the language of social justice, and now we are in this realm where, I, I brought you this book, because you will all ask me, what is social justice? Um, I'm, I'm going to be 50 years in about five months. And the word woke to me is, it's, it's new and foreign. It's like asking me to learn Mandarin. But uh, there is this movement, the social justice movement, and it's coming from the far left. They've always been there. I understand Marxism. I understand Leninism. I understand Trots Trotskyism, even though I can't pronounce it. Um, and I understand their form of anti-Semitism. 
But what this young generation of millennials are doing is they're saying they're fighting for the planet, they're fighting for minorities' rights, they're fighting for women, they're fighting against oppression. And what the Islamists are doing is they're embedding the, their anti-Semitism in that language. And so now you have this crazy alliance between the woke people and the anti-Semites on the left who were hiding their anti-Semitism before, or it wouldn't be, I mean, look at what's going on with the Labour Party, which by the way has got many Jewish members and, uh, and I would say prominent members. So it is, um, it, I, I think what, I, I'm a classical liberal. Uh, what attracted me to institutions like Oxford uh, is reason. It is the ability that human beings are able and capable, and that's what differentiates us from animals, is that we can reason our way out of problems. And so applying that reason, I think maybe the first step is to simply expose the problem. Um, people try to medicalize things, and I hate to do that, but I'm going to do it now. You can't you, you, you can't um, fight and defeat cancer if you don't understand the cancer cells, the molecules, things that cause it. So all these people in labs who are trying very hard to fight this problem have to make the problem as explicit as they possibly can. HIV, malaria, all of, you know, let's say, what nature throws at humanity. But when there's a challenge that human beings throw at one another, we, we, we try to fuzz things up, we obfuscate. And I think the first step is to say, what are we talking about? That is why I call this the special case of Islamist anti-Semitism. I know that institutions like Oxford are familiar with anti-Semitism. God, how many scholars have I met who have educated me on what anti-Semitism is? But then there's this special problem and it puzzles me that they don't want to name it. And if you don't name a problem, if you don't define a problem, if you don't look at all the different perspectives, then how on earth can you ever address it? That's very well said. And interestingly, in this uh, conference that we attended, the university came out for academic freedom and freedom of expression, right. freedom of association, but they never mentioned the issues of anti-Semitism and racism, which were prevalent at that meeting and yeah. overt. That's interesting. Well, I, I really think we should be honest about what is going on. I, 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 I witness what you witness in Germany. I witnessed it in the Netherlands. I saw it in France. Um, the Labour Party in the United Kingdom, uh, the Democrats in the United States. What we are seeing is center-left parties, for whatever reason, and maybe for a complex set of factors, uh, they're going in a direction that, in my view, center-left parties, um, we call them labor in this country. So you must think about it. These are parties uh, when, during the Industrial Revolution. Um, they re genuinely, the, those movements were about how can we lift poor people. Children were being subjected to working uh, adult jobs for long hours. Uh, people's injury, you know these, you know the history of these parties. And now these parties have been infiltrated infected, if you will, with um, ideas, again, that pose as social justice, equality, um, you name it, which is really an excuse for power, an excuse for uh, authoritarianism, for not having to answer to anyone, for a destruction of what we call freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of association, um, uh, the free enterprise and free politics. 
it's very sad, but it looks like we thought in 1989, we defeated the Soviet Union. And now here we are in 2019. And I think for whatever reason, they have infected us with something in our universities and political parties, especially the center left parties. And there, how can we say we are the winners? We're not the winners, we are the losers. And the Islamists are exploiting this. Because when you say Dawlat al Sharia, the state of Sharia, or Islamic law, to achieve that authoritarian utopia through the institutions, people in the media and in politics call it peaceful, but it's not peaceful. It's just nonviolent until, in their words, this is quote unquote, it is nonviolent until violence is necessary. And this is exactly what they did in Egypt, in Tunisia, even in Somalia, in Iran, anywhere where the Islamists have prevailed, it's always started with dawah. Raise your hand if you know what dawah is. Wow, this is an educated <laughs> audience. When I'm in the United States of America and I have an audience, sometimes 500, it doesn't matter, a large number of people, I ask them, do you know a jihad? All the hands go up. Do you know what now is? Two, three, four hands. So I think the University of Oxford is still doing something right. If you know what dawah is, if you know what the dawah is, it's the phase that precedes Sharia. And if you don't understand that, you're a fool. And not just a fool, as an institution that is supposed to educate young minds on what the trending ideas and ideologies are, you are a failure if you don't know what Dawa is. I am not saying that the problem on center-left parties and their anti-Semitism is caused by Islamist anti, it was there. But what the Islamist anti-Semites are doing is they're giving them an excuse to come out of the woodwork. Remember, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, it was the never again. We're not going to do this. Is not, this is the kind of thing that you can't say, you can't do, it's wrong, it's immoral. And then what happens with, I would say after Yasser Arafat and Bill Clinton come out and they can't make a deal and the Intifada starts, the Labour Party in the United Kingdom many of the left-wing parties, some of their members, I lived in the Netherlands, um, a woman who was married to the central banker put an enormous flag of Palestine right in front of a Jew. She lives in a Jewish community. She put it out there. She couldn't have done that if she hadn't thought that she was going to, I, I don't think her anti-Semitism was caused by Islamism or Muslim. She had it. She was an anti-Semite to begin with. But she gave her, she, she thought she had the license to come out of the woodwork by now claiming that she's fighting for the rights of the Palestinians. Number one. Number two, what Labour and the other left-wing parties have laid to waste. I know in this country, Tony Blair is hated. But I think what Tony Blair is doing is to say, let's go back and say, we don't want to be anti-Semites again. He is doing a really good job. Don't give these people an excuse to come out of the woodwork and be anti-Semitic because they are protecting a minority. They are not protecting a minority. This particular woman has absolutely no interest in the well-being of Muslim minorities. No interest whatsoever. She found a way to come out and say things that, I'll give you a few statements. They control everything. It's their money. They pull the strings. It's the dollars. That's the sort of thing that she was then able to come out and say, which we thought after 1945, we're not going to do that again. We're not going to take a subsection, a very small 
and vulnerable subsection of our population and throw them to the wolves. And she's doing it. So I'm not saying that, lay, I'm not saying Islamists caused it. What I want to point out is Islamists are exploiting it on the one hand. And on the other hand, they're being helped. They're being helped by the existing European anti -Semitism. I mean, they're propagating the um, elders of Zion. Why? How, how is that possible? How would an Arab, a Saudi Arabian, or a Tunisian, or a Somali person even know of these pamphlets? But now they're everywhere, in every language, every language, with all the stereotypes. How did that happen? Thank you. Professor pa David Patterson from the University of Texas. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Professor Ali. It's, a, it's an honor and pleasure to stand as close to you. Um, yes, what, I think what you say about uh, the, 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 the uh, Islamic, uh, Islamist... The special case of Islamist anti-Semitism, yeah. Yes. There's a lot of money, There's, the scale is huge, they're making use of social um, justice, the social just prevailing social Justice narrative, and yeah, they set moral traps. Well, yeah, and they, it seems to me they not only enable the other anti Semites, as an mm -hmm. example you give, to come out, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, and in the, in, the, in the discourse of social justice, mm -hmm. is there not uh, the implication that not only is it permissible, it's morally desirable. Yeah. Uh, that, that it's cloaked in righteousness. That's so, the social and justice. It's not only fashionable, but uh, socially required, and, in, and especially on college campuses, when young people want to be good. Yeah. They want to be moral. They want to stand up for those who are vulnerable, those who are weak. Yeah. Uh, and that, in a way, I mean, you ask me, uh, tell me your, your view on this. Is it, is it the case that sometimes, especially in the young, what is good in them can, can, is exploited yeah. uh, for, to, to these nefarious ends? That, that it's the problem on the United States campuses. I don't know, look, I don't know if we have this problem in Oxford and in Cambridge and uh, I, I've been reading the British newspapers and I see that some of it is seeping into here, uh, disinviting people for their opinions, that sort of thing. Um, I, I thought, you know, the British, they have that stiff upper lip, they're dignified, they're not supposed to, you know, you don't go out and, and say, I'm offended. Um, you'd be laughed at if you were offended all the time. Uh, so I, I, didn't, I, d I don't know how big of a problem it is in the UK. When I go around my friends and I ask them, do you know what woke is? They don't know what woke is. Uh, but most people in my environment in the US know what woke is. And, um, and they're inhibited by it. And they feel trapped. And people don't feel that they can be honest and that they can tell the truth. Um, and, and this, I, for a while, about eight or 10 years, I thought it's a problem that's um, in universities, college campuses, and that you know, once these students get out into the real world, they'll be confronted with the real world. Um, but now I see corporations, the United States government, they're all going woke. <laughs> um, yeah. And so that's when you have to think, God, this is a problem. And, you know, we, we can't laze about and just think that things are going to fix it. You know, she'll grow out of it. You can't say that anymore. Um, so you're absolutely right. Uh, this, this is going on. And... Um, to be very specific about what you're saying, in, in, in the woke narrative, there's a matrix of victims. Everybody is victimized by the white man. 
Now, to stick just with the subject of anti-Semitism, because that's what we're to talk about here. I'm not here to talk about woke culture and all its um, problems. I, I just want to talk about anti-Semitism. But anti-Semitism is now a white man. Can you just even believe how this has been warped? It, a white man, there's a white man in military uniform, IDF of Israel, and so it is a white privilege problem. I remember reading an article somewhere with a child, uh, a child, uh, a young person, a kid, Princeton, who said he was accused of being, um, it, he didn't understand things because he was suffering from white privilege. And he responded to that and said, well, both of my grandparents died in the, during the Holocaust. My parents escaped the Holocaust. How on earth could you think of me as having white privilege? And when they went to America, they had to start from scratch. And I think he was the first of his generation to go to college and to go to Princeton. So what does white privilege mean in that context? I have Irish friends who say that they're, you know, they fled Ireland. They blame the English for everything, but that's okay. And they came and they say they were subjected to the most humiliating circumstances. And now they're being accused of enjoying white privilege. So the narrative of this whole woke social justice nonsense, it doesn't make sense. No one is standing up to them. It is sickening and it's disturbing and it's alarming that institutions like universities keep caving in and in and in. I think it is perfectly possible to fight racism, segregation, to give homosexuals and transgender people their place, their dignified place in society without having to sacrifice what we have achieved, what our civilization has achieved. And I think going back to anti-Semitism, making anti-Semitism trendy again is really the wrong way to go. Critical thinking. If you have been to Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard or Stanford or any of those supremely expensive universities and you haven't walked out four years later, three years later, five years later, and you are incapable of thinking critically, then these institutions have failed. My last lecture would say, going to these institutions as a freshman, you don't know anything about the world. Don't treat them like daycare centers. It's not. <laughs> you go and learn to think, how to think, not what to think. That would be my last lecture. And I'm grateful to my professors at the University of Leiden for giving that to me. And if you find yourself constrained by the prevailing orthodoxy, and now the prevailing orthodoxy is this, <laughs> it's woke. It, it's not even an orthodoxy. It's, it has no sense of coherence. It's silly. It's backwards. But if you find yourself constrained by the prevailing orthodoxy, then fight it. And if you can't fight it, leave. Let others do it. But the institution survives and the institution thrives and those who come to the institution survive and thrive and I don't know if they stand up to the prevailing orthodoxy. So this whole thing about, oh, Jordan Peterson is invited to come to the University of Cambridge and then he's disinvited. This particular individual is invited and then he's disinvited. That is, you know, I would say if I look at history and think, God, those days they actually had to deal with the Pope they had to deal with kings and queens. They had military, you know, you had to deal with Stalin for heaven's sake. <laughs> and now, you, now you're saying, I'm going to nix my entire research program because somebody's going to call me a racist. 
And I think that now, that's wondrous. Yeah, for, I can see all of us, people coming from Africa, we think that just name calling, they're not going to kill you. <laughs> they're not going to take your head off and run away with it. They're not going to kill your entire family. It's just, they're just gonna call you racist and you're going to call off the whole thing? Come on. <laughs> 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 I mean, let's, there are so many flavors of anti-Semitism, I don't know where to begin it. On the right, there's all this, um, uh, the Arianism, um, the Catholic Church, um, the Jews betrayed Jesus, the religious part of that. Anti-Semitism has been around for so long. And I, 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 really, I, I really think we should put out a reading list on experts who have looked at every single segment of the source of anti-Semitism. With the Islamists, what I see are two things. Um, there's the use of theology. They, first, they, they'll quote or cite the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad. They will say the Prophet Muhammad trusted in Jews and they betrayed him and therefore he had a license to kill them. That is carried on to that day. That's sort of the theological, theoretical framework or the underpinning for that. And then there's the whole Palestine, Israel thing. I've, I, that's what I've studied. That's what I've understand. That has come to me as a child. I've never seen a Jew before in my life until I was 24 years or something like that. I come from a country that is not geographically, is not a neighbor of Israel. We, we are not affected. If you live in Somalia, you're not affected by Israel or Israeli politics. And so in a way, I did think when I was made to think a little bit more curiously to come to understand these particular prejudices, then why on earth do I hate them? I don't even know what they look like. I don't know who they are. My cousins, I hate some of them. They hated me for a reason, because we fought over a water hole. We fought over wives. We fought over horses. We fought over property. There was a reason to hate because of proximity. But we have no proximity. If you live in Somalia or in Pakistan or in Afghanistan or in Indonesia, you have no proximity with Israel or Jewish people. So then why do you hate them? And when you reflect on that, that is when you come to understand all oh, anti-Semitism. I had never heard of the word anti-Semitism until I was 24. Now you go to colonialism, imperialism, la la la. I think that, uh, when Britain was an empire, Britain did a lot of good things and some bad things happened. At my, in my age and where I come from, I think it's, we think it's a shame and a scandal that we can only talk about what went wrong and can never talk about what was right. And the, the, it, it's, it's one of these things, it's one of these crazy things. <laughs> Woke people are making us, not study these things, you know. So uh, the question of imperialism, colonialism, Eurocentrism, whatever, I think it's a much more complex. And when, uh, I don't know, I hope when, when, when things become more agreeable, we may be able to reflect on the pluses and the minuses of what we've inherited from those years. Uh, how we can compare, say, French imperialism to Anglo-imperialism, that sort of thing. Uh, and where does, uh, where does anti-Semitism fit into that? I just want to point out um, the British fought Hitler and that says something for them. When the Ottoman Empire came to an end, some of those in the leadership roles were saying, what did we wrong? What did we do wrong? What went wrong? What happened? And um, some went obviously in the direction of, let's westernize, let's become European. The Europeans have colonized us, they've invaded us, uh, they, they won, so let's be like them. But the other side said, no, let's go back because we, we fail to be an empire ourselves because we abandoned what was originally ours, what was authentic and that is to go back to pure Sharia. 
So the narrative ever since, end of 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, the narrative ever since of those Islamists was, let's go back. But in saying, let's go back, when they look in the mirror, they don't see themselves. They see the Europeans, the white man, penetrating, taking, imposing, colonizing, and all the rest of it. And that's the narrative that they pushed. Then along come the Bolsheviks and the Stalinists, and it's the same, they, they've, I think they do find some kind of a rhyme there. So the left, the far left, this alliance, dalliance, whatever you want to call it, with those who are seeking Sharia has always been there. It's, it started with the same sort of resentment. The blaming of the Jews and the Jews and the Jewish people, and especially Jewish thinkers are being seen as traitors of the cause. They betrayed Muhammad, they betrayed the proletariat dream, the utopia. These narratives flow into one another. And if you care to look in what is now called social media and you just have to go through the trash, that's what you find. These narratives and the way they impact people. That's why I said somebody needs to do a PhD on this alliance. And I know that some people have already done that, but it is just the way it's moving fast, fast, fast. And I think we need to, we, I think it's a serious, serious thing because it's influential. It is transforming in any case, center left parties in Europe, in Australia, in New Zealand, in the United States of America, it's transformative. And I don't know, when they look at each other, you look at the atheist far left. In this country, you know Corbyn, so the Corbynist personality. And they go off against Western civilization and all its benefits, and all they see is negative, all they see is bad, all they see is horrible. And opposite them is someone wearing a headscarf or a beard or completely allied with Sharia. But they never get to the moment that ISIS showed us. You remember ISIS? We got a glimpse of it where it doesn't matter what your alliance was. It doesn't matter that you hated Western civilization. It doesn't matter. They took your head off anyway. And I really think that we need to expose them to one another, that that alliance of convenience is skin deep and it's the Corbynists who are losing. So it's not innate to hate, or maybe it is innate to hate. Uh, it probably is. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the innate, I just want to get to that innate bit, which is, it is innate to love, it's innate to hate, it's innate to envy, it's innate to admire, it's innate to desire, it's innate to give. All of this is in every individual, but it is, what's fascinating about human history is you always have these figures that do appeal to one or the other sentiment and are able to you know, monopolize an entire crowd in one direction or the other. Um, I was in London two weeks ago, everybody was talking about a climate emergency. Uh, that means we've been able to appeal to human nature and to say this is something that needs urgency and so on. So, but, but it is, it's there. You know, you should be talking to marketing experts, to public relations people. It's they, they appeal to something innate in us, something we want, we desire. On hating the other, opposing the other, not wanting the other, I, got, I almost think that is just as old as humanity. Now, the question for anti-Semitism is, of all those innate hatreds, why did this one take off and why did it become universal? 
they are, they are, I'm not an expert, they're real experts who have done real, rigorous, quality work on it. Would they be invited to come to Oxford today? And if they can't be invited to come to Oxford and speak publicly or write publicly, how awful is that? Look, on the hyper-irrationality, hyper-rationality, um, I think as human beings, we are very, very complex. And it's just not enough to just uh, be uh, reasonable all the time and rely on reason. Reason is just one part of the human story. Um, let me give you a, a metaphor. Um, in the United States of America, we are now dealing with an epidemic of addiction. We have about 60,000 people who overdose and die. And when you read about how they should be treated, some of the treatments show them a picture of the brain and they say, this part of your brain, that's your prefrontal cortex, and the back is the amygdala. The part that wants you to take the drug or whatever it is that makes you high is in the back. It's, it's the base part of your brain. And the part that tells you don't do it, it's suicidal, it's bad, that reasons with you is the PFC. What that tells you is that the human being has both. You have the base and you have the reason, and somewhere you have to find a balance. And society has to find a balance. So those people who go traipsing around and saying, we only need reason, 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 they're going to be confronted sooner or later with the fact that that just is not satisfying. It's, that's, that's what makes the human complexity. So you have to satisfy all parts of humanity, human history, beauty, love, desire, irrationality. There's, there are so many things that are absolutely beautiful and desirable and wondrous and appealing about irrationality. And the same for reason, but there has to be that balance. And I think as humans, we are going to keep grappling with it, which gives you no answer. How do we deal with the Islamists who now are producing this, let's just be rational. It's, this, it's just to keep throwing reason at them, keep showing them. We can't, if, everywhere you apply Sharia, this is the outcome. It's misery for women misery for children, misery for gay people, prejudice, anti-Semitism, you name it. You are not going to achieve what you promise. So let's find some kind of balance. Then you go to the other parts, which is what is happening with, you know, our own wonderful, affluent, liberal societies that you and I came to, and we thought this is a salvage. <laughs> Look at the division. There are these countries that are called developing countries, and then there are the countries that are called developed countries. So people in the developing countries thought they would be like the developed. And if you just go away from the material and you think, God, now we're going to, you know, we're going to restrain ourselves, have the stiff upper lip, be dignified about these things. And now we have people coming around and saying they're offended at absolutely every, they're preemptively offended. And this, these are middle class, Western affluent people. So I think that irrationality hasn't gone away. It has some, it is something that we have to grapple and grapple and grapple with. And all irrationality at some point starts to lean on something unscientific, it will lean on the proposition, Jews control the world. They're pulling strings. Or the prevailing, if you ask me right now, orthodoxy is white men. All white men are to be feared. All white men are oppressors. Women are their victims. Blacks are their victims. They've created a matrix of victims. And you have to know what 
victim is where and what to say when. Irrationality, it's the prevailing irrationality, but it is something that we have to fight and it is institutions like this and then the woke people and then the people who are afraid of the woke people and call people who stand up to the woke people brave. If you know the history of nationalism, you'll know um, English nationalism is different from French nationalism, which, which is different from German nationalism. Uh, if you understand these differences and strains, um, I think you're going to come and appreciate that nationalism is not only something that gave birth to uh, Hitler, that was ger German nationalism, it was new, it was... Um, but the emergence of the idea of the nation and nation states was a good thing. And it's still the world order that we have. And I haven't come across anybody, regardless of how clever they are, who has come up with a proposition that changes the nation state. They haven't come up with anything else. So until that time, I suppose nation states are the institutions that work. They're not perfect, but they work. They work for now. Um, I come from Somalia. We kill one another. We hate one another, abhor one another. And it's all because of clan. And when the British, the Italians, and the French came along and they forced us into what is now a nation state, we had to make something out of it and create the idea of we have a past together and a destiny and a flag and an army. It didn't work, but it might lead to something. The Kenyans are working at it, the Nigerians are working at it, the Indians have succeeded at it. So the idea of the nation state actually does work. So if you want to throw the baby with the bathwater, fine. There are bad things about some parts of nationalism and the nation state, but some of it, if it's incremental and it's slow and it does what it does, which is the English nationalism, um, then I think that is something, maybe one day we could convert all human beings to think of themselves as the inhabitants of one nation called the planet. But that's not where we are right now. That's just so ambitious, so unrealistic, so out of control. It's just what we talked about earlier. It is, if you say it is to put down, uh, so 15 years ago, I was, yeah, yeah, let's just put that down. It's so irrational and stupid, let's just set it aside. But as you mature and grow, people don't want to set aside their heritage. They don't want to set aside their way of doing things, their rituals. It's, that's just not going to happen. It's not, it's not realistic. It's and it's not advisable. So I think ultimately, and maybe that's why a lot of people are jealous of the Jews and the state of Israel, it's like, God, how, how have you kept this up for so long? <laughs> it is, people should have their, irras I mean, you call it, irra to say irrationality, is, it's not to insult. You talked about, who, who is the person who talked about irrationality? Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it, it's not an insult, you know. If people want to gather around um, the table and have a ritual, drink their, let them do that. Let people have their rituals and their ways of being together and making a family a family. Let's preserve the institution of family. Because I'll tell you, one of the biggest disagreements I have with my um, atheist friends is, this uh, throwing and dis just discarding the institution of family as something reactionary and stupid and irrational. And I think I, I, I disagree with them 100%, and I'm going to take the brunt for that. That's fine. I think, you may think it's irrational, but I think that the best environment in which to bring up children is with a mother and a father 
who are married and love one another. If you think that's irrational and stupid, that's up to you. But give me an empirical, and here's where science starts to matter. Give me an empirical alternative that, apply, that works for the largest number of human beings. You won't find it. And so I find science convincing. You come around and you say, there's, gender is fluid. You know what, it's fashionable, fine. But biology speaks, there are men, there are women, there are boys, there are girls, there's male, there's female. And right now you don't have a quarrel with me, you have a quarrel with biology, you have a quarrel with science. So, and this is the world we live in. The world we live in is where they're saying, you can't have the wisdom of the past without what the, what the modern world and technology and science has to offer. You have to forsake one or the other. I don't want to forsake any or the other. You cannot forsake the past to enjoy the future. You can't forsake the future to enjoy the past. I think you have to build on what we already have. And that is why I'm against these people, the woke people. If you look at the history of South Africa and you look at apartheid and the people who protested against apartheid, you're going to find so many Jewish activists there who are anti-apartheid. And so you can imagine what an affront it is to then go to these people and say that they're actually racists and, <laughs> and committing these terrible crimes. But if Africans, African Americans, black people, vulnerable communities have lifted themselves out of poverty, and when I talk about poverty, it's not just material poverty, you know, comfort and cushioning, but education and thinking and critical thinking, they, were going, they would find more in common. They'll have more things in common with the Jewish population and the state of Israel than they will with the Wahhabists and the Muslim Brotherhood. I mean, I was in the Netherlands and loads of Somalis are in debt and these, Somali, these Dutch officials are asking me, what can we do about it? And I said, they're in debt because they'll take money from welfare benefits or whatever they want and they'll send it home. And if you send every penny home, you're going to stay in welfare. The collective prevails. So if you really want to, the, to get to the bottom of these issues, you have, it's inescapable. You do have to start talking about culture. And what I've seen in the years that I have been here is that people are uncomfortable, supremely uncomfortable to talk about culture. If you don't talk about culture, you're not going to resolve. You can't answer, the psychiatrist can't do his job. You can't do your job. I can't do my job. And then we just keep going, you know, we go into the next generation and repeat the same mistakes and the next generation, the next generation. But you do have to discuss the superstition. But when the superstition is put on the forefront, people get offended. Why would they not get offended? They'll get offended. But it used to be that you talked past the offense. Imagine in the small, smallpox epidemic, if people said, now I want to hug my loved one, you wouldn't argue with that, obviously you do, but these are the consequences. You have to make a choice. You have agency, this is science, and this virus or bacteria or germ is indifferent. It doesn't care about your culture. So do you want to live for the next generation or do you want to go with the person in the grave? They never ask that question. That is, I think, where you and I come in, where you say you have to force them, force them to understand this. And I, it will for us, we are going there. Is it innate, um, the left, or is it, uh, are there individuals who are take abusing, taking advantage of, um, let me put it more bluntly, <laughs> is Jeremy Corbyn the left or is the left Jeremy Corbyn? <laughs> and I think it's a bit of both. I think that um, after the Industrial Revolution, there was a genuine question about how 
the ordinary man and the ordinary women were treated. And um, an institution like the Labour Party um, was on the forefront of fighting for women's emancipation, for higher wages, um, uh, for people against child labor. These were all very good and wonderful questions to ask. And I think a lot has been achieved. So I don't think we can set aside center left parties based on what we are seeing today. I do think they've been infiltrated by, yes, the wrong people. But when I say it's a bit of both, I also want to point out that there were always among the left those who demonized free enterprise and political freedom and always saw the world through a prism of just power, those on top and those on the bottom and nothing else. Nothing could be negotiated. You will find that history. I mean, I, I, I took political science and it comes in a lot of nuances. And there were some leaders who were very good and there were some leaders who were very, very bad. And I, I really think we are now in a place where we have a bad leadership, the Democratic Party, in the United States of America, big. I think in a democracy, an opposition party, a major opposition party is a valuable thing. And what is happening to our Democratic Party is absolutely alarming. What's happening to the Labour Party, alarming. I was in the, Nether in the Netherlands, the Social Democrats, Germany, the SDP, the Socialist Party in, G in France. These parties do have to start to rethink what it is that they stand for now. And they are in a moral and intellectual and ideological confusion. And that's why you have people like Corbyn in the forefront. Liberal feminism, um, gosh. <laughs> I don't want to be fired. <laughs> I've got many colleagues who feel if you are a white woman and you have um, fought for liberal, fem you're a liberal and you're a feminist, you don't say anything about people of color. So the Me Too, they will denounce and condemn Weinstein, what's his name? I'm not particularly a fan of Hollywood, so I, I don't really know much about what goes on there, but um, uh, what's his name? Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein. That one, Harvey Weinstein, and uh, uh, what is the guy from? All of these individual powerful white men, but they're very, 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 they don't know what to do. Um, do you know how many women were abused and subjected to The sorts of things that came out, Bill Cosby, some, there was a black guy, it, 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 it took them a long time to say anything about it, and they are actually not doing it. And then there's radical Islam. And then, you know, I'm looking at the African contingent there, the view on women in Africa. They're not going to address that because deep down they believe this is something that African women need to do themselves. Muslim women need to do themselves and so on. And um, tragedies, I was raised a Muslim and I come out and I say, well, this is what's being done to us. Can we stop it? And there you are an Islamophobe. So as a Muslim woman, as an African woman, you're going to have to fight on the level of within your own community to change things. And then you're going to have to fight these darned liberal women who are calling themselves feminists, but who are really an obstacle, which is a tragedy. But over a time, we just think of them as a joke. So I had, first of all, I want to say on behalf of everybody here, we wish you continued strength and success. And we're really grateful that you came here with, with us tonight. And thank yeah. you for sharing your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.